Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast featuring a team of public relations professionals at Pinkston in Washington, D.C. From media personalities to pioneers in healthcare and disruptors in business, we talk with some of America's most interesting people who tell interesting stories. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. This is Coffee with Closers. And now, a quick message from our episode sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Silencer Shop, the largest distributor of firearm suppressors in the country. A single incident of loud noise can cause permanent hearing damage. With almost all firearms creating noise over 140 decibels, a silencer can protect you and the people around you from hearing loss. Silencer Shop's team of sales and compliance experts make acquiring a silencer simple. With their easy step-by-step process of purchasing a silencer, you can enjoy safer, quieter hunts and days at the range. There are more than 1,000 silencer shop powered kiosks at partner dealerships in 42 states. So getting your documentation in order has never been easier. Visit silencershop.com to learn more today. I'm Steve Burke. I'm Caroline Costa. And I'm Dylan Martinez. From Navy, from Navy SEAL to runaway New York Times bestselling author, Jack Carr is a man who does it all and does it well. He is currently the author of four high-octane, suspense-filled fictional thrillers, The Terminalist, True Believer, Savage Son, and The Devil's Hand. His novels follow former Navy SEAL sniper James Reese through a world of conspiracies, international espionage, and revenge, and all have landed on the New York Times bestseller list. Later this year, Amazon Prime will launch The Terminalist, a thriller series starring Chris Pratt, Taylor Kitsch, and Patrick Schwarzenegger. Reese will be played by Pratt. Prior to becoming an author, Jack spent 20 years in the Navy where he served as a SEAL sniper, team leader, platoon commander, troop commander, and task unit commander. As an officer, he led assault and sniper teams in Iraq and Afghanistan. As a platoon commander, he practiced counterinsurgency in the Southern Philippines. And he also commanded a special operations task unit in southern Iraq during the drawdown of U.S. forces. When he's not putting pen to paper, Jack is an avid outdoorsman and the host of his own Danger Clothes podcast, where he interviews warriors, tactical experts, historians, politicians, hunters, entrepreneurs, today's newsmakers, and fellow writers. He also appears regularly on national television programs discussing defense and other related issues of the day. Whether it be in print, on the big screen, or downrange, Jack is a closer. Jack, welcome to the show. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me on. Super excited to, to be here. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, before we begin, Jack, we wanted to uh, just thank you for your many years of service uh, in defense of freedom in our country and all the uh, all of the, the way of life as we have it today. So we want to thank you very much from the bottom of our heart. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, let's begin. Um, you have a new Amazon series coming up uh, with some big time stars. That's pretty exciting stuff. How, how did that process work? How did, how did you get there? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I think everybody's experience is probably a little different. That's one of my main takeaways is that there's not like a, a normal process. Like you get there a different way each and every project, I think anyway. But uh, yeah, this one was crazy because as I started writing this in December of 2014, I thought of Chris Pratt playing my main character playing Navy SEAL sniper James Reese. And back then, he had only starred in uh, Parks and Rec as Andy Dwyer, so not someone you typically think of as playing a Navy SEAL sniper. Uh, And then he had a very small role in Zero Dark Thirty, the movie about the Bin Laden raid. So um, for some reason, I just thought he's the guy. And I think that's because I thought of, well, my character needed to be likable. That was very important to me. I wanted uh, him to be someone that you'd want to sit down and have a beer with or have a coffee with as you're, yeah. um, as you're, uh, as I was writing it. Uh, and then I thought of, oh, if somebody plays this character in an adaptation, that that actor has to be likable as well. And I thought, that's Chris Pratt. Um, even though he hadn't done Avengers, hadn't done Guardians of the Galaxy, hadn't done Jurassic World, anything like that, um, wasn't really quite 
you know, too well known yet, but I thought he's the guy. And I thought that's because growing up in the eighties, Tom Hanks did all those comedies and then he took a risk with Philadelphia and they could do whatever he wanted after that. So I thought, who's that person today that needs to take that risk, that needs to show his viewers that he can do something uh, darker, grittier, grittier, more primal, more violent. Um, and I thought, that's Chris Pratt and he's the guy. And uh, then I didn't know I had a con connection to him, but right before my book came out about uh, in November of 2017, when the book came out in March, uh, an old SEAL buddy called me and uh, said he wanted to thank me for something I did for him in the SEAL teams and I couldn't even remember what it was. And he said, hey, you brought me into your office, you sat me down, talked to me about transition and then introduced me to people in the private sector. And I always wanted to thank you. And I was like, no problem, how's it, how's it going? And he said, uh, it's going great, but I heard you have a book coming out. And I said, yeah, it's coming out in a few months. I have these galley copies, these, these, uh, these kind of rough drafts I can send you. And he said, yeah, I'd love to check that out, but I'd like to go to a friend of mine. And I said, yeah, who's that? And he said, Chris Pratt. So sent it to him, he gave it to Chris. Chris read it in December and then a week later called and wanted to option it. So that's how that, uh, that's how that got kicked off. That's awesome. Crazy. Great. great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, so I know you said, uh, you know, you, you helped, you know, you always envisioned him playing this role. Uh, so have you helped him, you know, prepare for it in any way? And, you know, if so, how? Yeah, it was a weird year to do that sort of thing because of COVID. So all through 2020, everybody's pretty much locked down. You know, they have these other projects they're working on, that sort of thing. So I think if uh, everything wasn't locked down earlier in earlier in 2020 and throughout the rest of the, the year, we probably would have done more pre-training. Um, but what but we didn't get to do that. So what he's doing for the most part is on set training. And luckily we have a lot of SEALs right there on set with him throughout this process. Uh, that guy who called me, he has a part in the uh, in the series and we were in the SEAL teams together. So uh, they were over in Australia filming the next, uh, I think it was next Thor movie. And while they were over there, they were training and they were practicing and they were doing all these things to get Chris kind of up to speed because as soon as he got back from that, he stepped right into to this role. And uh, one of the opening scenes is actually you know him as a as a SEAL troop commander, um, and we have brought other SEALs in to play SEAL roles. We surrounded by SEALs in this uh, in this first episode, which was pretty pretty cool to see. So he's getting a lot of on the job type training, and then I've been out to set twice, and we've gone over stuff with pistols and knives and that sort of thing. So uh, and he's he's a quick study, and yeah, it's a good solid foundation already from which to build upon. So I think he's having a lot of fun. He sure looks like he's having a lot of fun on set what's really cool is that you know you're joking around you're hanging out you're talking and then it's action boom and he's in it you know which is so cool to see like somebody transform like that which is really cool that's great yeah no he's people like being you know, you gotta have a switch flip it on and off you know especially you know he, he plays such a you know a hilarious character in all of his shows and everything you know you said you were on set with him you know out there helping him film you know, any any funny stories that you've been able to to get out of, out of chris or anything happen on the set you like to share uh, they're being pretty uh, tight lipped about it, what actually uh, happens on set, you know, and photos are like <laughs> locked down by Amazon uh, on set. So I got really lucky that Antoine Fuqua directing, and that's who I wanted to direct, by the way, also. Um, I thought he'd be the perfect director, and he ends up being the guy that's directing this first episode, and then he's an executive producer along with me and Chris, like overseeing the whole thing. So every different episode has a director, and then he'll get to kind of oversee all that in editing as we put this whole thing together so that's uh that's kind of cool but i'm very lucky he posted a picture of all of us so i was like yes if antoine posted it, then i can <laughs> repost it uh because they're being very uh strict about what you do on on <laughs> set there but uh no it's it, he's just he's fantastic and it's really like a military operation that's what, what's another one of my takeaways i have a few different takeaways um one was how hard everybody works out there uh because the outside looking in you think oh hollywood it's easy you know you're just out there acting and people bring you your food and you know yeah okay but it, i was so impressed with how hard everybody works at every single level on set and the other one was just how specific each and every person is with what they do on that set. So, um, you know, from everybody from the, the key grip to the transportation guy, everybody is so good at their specific job. It makes the whole thing run smooth and uh, or as smooth as possible when you have 350 people and all these moving parts to include explosions and weapons and night vision and everything being on time and it's cr and on budget and all that sort of thing. So that's kind of kind of crazy. Um, but what also struck me was how similar it is to a military operation in that you have craft food services 
feeding everyone. Like the uh, army logistics train has to feed the entire army. Um, you have the mobility guy in a SEAL platoon. You have the transportation guy on set. You have the explosives guy in a SEAL platoon, the person who's doing the breaching and setting up all the breaching charges. Well, on set, you have the explosion guy that's going to figure out all that stuff for uh, for the stunts and, and all the rest of it. You have the, the, uh, in the SEAL platoon, you have an armorer who is... Uh, uh, in charge of all the weapons and making sure you have accountability for all those at the end of a mission or a training cycle or whatever whatever it might be. Same thing on set. Those actors walk through, they get all done up and all their stuff and someone hands them a weapon, marks it off, hands them the night vision, boom, yeah, all that stuff. And then at the end of the, of the film, the filming that day, they have to turn it all back in and that guy has to mark it down. So there's, and like the head guy, Antoine Fuqua, like he's like the, the commanding officer. The director is like the commanding officer of a SEAL team. And then Chris, as the uh, as the lead actor, he's like the uh, the platoon commander or the troop commander, which is actually what he's playing in the series. So that's kind of cool too. And both of those guys are setting the tone for everybody else on set. So to have these two guys that are just so positive, uh, so fun to be around, so smart, uh, all of that just you know infects everybody else on set and uh, and makes for a really uh, productive, positive working environment. And so many people made the point both time, both weeks that I've been on set to come up and tell me that, to tell me that, hey, they've worked on hundreds of movies and they've never felt this way about a film before, which is kind of cool. And then uh, also in that first episode, it was like a reunion. We had so many SEALs on set, some guys <laughs> I hadn't seen for years. And so it was like a reunion. So we're having a blast out there. It was it was so much fun. That's awesome. No, I love the the parallel, you know, between the teams and, and Hollywood. Something, I mean, I know I never would have thought of that, uh, yeah. but I like the way you put that. And, you know, that, that kind of leads me to my next question, um, you know, uh, about your books. You know, do, you, do your, any of your books feature scenes or characters that, you know, stem from actual missions you've executed uh, during your time downrange? Yeah, most of it comes from the feelings and emotions behind certain events that I was involved with. So I take those and I apply them to a completely fictional narrative. So instead of having to like track down a SEAL sniper from uh, that served in Ramadi, Iraq in 2006, and then interview that person and then take his answers and then uh, you know filter them through whatever biases, preconceived notions, previous interviews, life experience that I have, and then taking that and applying it to a fictional narrative. Rather, I just remember what it was like to go in and do that job at the height of the war. And then I put those feelings into this fictional narrative. So there's not those other barriers and filters in place, which I think is one of the things that made it stand out to Simon & Schuster, uh, who sees thousands of these things come across their desks every year. Uh, I think that's really one of the main things that made it stand out to them and uh, really want to take a risk on me as a complete unknown. Um, there are a couple specific instances that are that do come from uh, from real uh, events that I that I morph a little bit and put into the stories. Uh, particularly in that first one, uh, there was a campaign I was involved with in uh, Najaf, Iraq, in 2004 to retake that city from uh, the the Jaysh al-Mahdi militia, which was Muqtada al-Sadr's militia, and uh, it was uh, 11 days of constant uh, urban combat, 24/7. And uh, there were two different events that happened there that I combined into one uh, as a memory for my protagonist in the first novel. And I changed it to Fallujah and I morphed those two events together from a single battle. So there are things like that that do come up, but for the most part, it's uh, the feelings and emotions behind these events that uh, I lend to this fictional narrative, which really makes the feelings seem authentic because they're coming from a real place. Yeah, yeah, you know, you could definitely tell in the opening of, of the terminal list. I mean, that that's a heavy, that's a heavy intro. So, you know, I, I definitely see where you're coming from on that. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Yeah, I was, I was ambushed one uh, one night outside of Baghdad in a, in a neighborhood. And uh, I don't talk about that specific um, event, but I take those emotions whenever I have an ambush in a story. I think back to what that was that was like, and I take that and I apply it to the, to the novel. Yeah. No, thank you. That, that's yeah. Cool. So everything about your story is like absolutely incredible. Um, you know, going from being a SEAL to an author, but your mom was a librarian. So you grew up loving books and reading. Who were your author heroes, if you will, as a kid? Yeah. So I read, I mean, it was natural, which was pretty cool. So I tried to make it natural for our kids. And I read to our kids yeah. from the day they got home from the hospital, like uh, up to the age where they kind of got too old to, for me to be reading to them and tried to make it natural part of their lives like my parents did. And it didn't take, which is what ah, it drives me crazy. Oh, no. um, so I'm hoping maybe audiobooks will be their, their gateway because me spending all that time reading to them as kids uh, didn't, uh, you know, that wasn't the gateway. Um, but yeah, I, I was just surrounded by books. My parents made it very natural um, for us to, it was just something we did. It wasn't like, 
hey, now's our reading time. You have to read, forcing us to do it, trying to bribe us with, you know, snacks or ice cream or something. You know, if, if we read, it was just like a natural thing that we did. Uh, I was surrounded by these books, mom being a librarian, always going to bookstores when we would travel or whatever else, going to libraries when we would travel. Like it was just a normal part of growing up. Um, and then I, was, I knew that I wanted to be a SEAL from a very early age. So I was doing this research with my mom at the local library. And back then there was hardly anything written on SEALs so you could actually read everything. Uh, and then by the time I hit about 10 years old, that's when that transition from kind of young adult reading for me happened to the same books that my parents were reading. So that's when Tom Clancy came out with Hunt for Red October. Um, so I read that and then I found David Morrell and who created character Rambo back in 1972, uh, AJ Pollock, uh, Mark Olden, Nelson DeMille, uh, all these guys in the 80s uh, who had protagonists with backgrounds that I wanted in real life one day. So I just dove into these novels, absolutely loved them because I knew that these authors had done research for their novels. And you couldn't like check that stuff back then. Of course, there's no internet. Um, so you're like, oh, I trust that Nelson DeMille did this research. I trust that Tom Clancy did this research into John Clark and whoever he's talking about. Um, and I just devoured these. And I knew that one day after my time in the SEAL teams that I would write these same kind of novels that I was enjoying so much growing up. So uh, Brotherhood of the Rose, Fraternity of the Stone, League of Night and Fog by David Morrell really stand out to me. Those were very influential to me growing up because of a couple of lines that uh, one, one sentence in particular, David Morrell has in Brotherhood of the Rose, where he mentions seals. And that kind of cemented me along my path. I'm like, if the guy who created Rambo is saying this about seals in Brotherhood <laughs> of the Rose, then I'm on the right path here. You know, so it also goes to show just how impactful kind of popular culture can be. Uh, when we're talking about these kind kind of novels, they certainly were impactful to me, not just in making me want to be an author one day, but uh, along my path into the SEAL teams as well. So, um, so yeah, I've, I've, and I've been a fan of these guys my entire life. I continue to read them them all today. Uh, and of course, along the way, I also discovered Stephen Hunter and then uh, Daniel Silva and then Vince Flynn and Brad Thor and today Mark Brainy. Um, so I, I've been a student, I guess, of the genre for about as long as I can remember. And then my mom also introduced me to Joseph Campbell in about 1988 through a series of interviews he did on PBS with Bill Moyers called The Power of Myth. I think they had three books that came out from those interviews. Um, so I found out about Hero with a Thousand Faces. I, I found out how that influenced George Lucas with Star Wars. And uh, I just, after reading that book, you know, no matter what book I read or what movie I saw or TV adaptation, whatever it was, I think I applied that hero's journey to these different mediums and would say, okay, that this worked because I love this movie. Oh, I look at it, follow that, that kind of that hero's journey, at least have these main elements of it. Or, hey, this I didn't really like over here. And why is that? Oh, maybe it didn't incorporate some of these things that Joseph Campbell talks about in Hero with a Thousand Faces. So uh, I guess I've been a student of the genre for as long as I can remember. And then my third novel, Savage Son, was really a tribute to the most dangerous game written by Richard Connell back in 1924. Um, and even back when I read that in sixth grade, I knew that one day I would write a modern day novel that paid tribute to that short story. So um, I've just been been a reader and a student of the genre my entire life. So I feel very, I feel like the foundation was built very early and it would be very different yeah. if I just woke up one day and said, oh, I think I want to be a novelist. Who should I have been reading for the last 30 plus years? You know, I think that'd be different rather than going along this journey and reading these guys. Like I remember reading um, uh, Louis L'Amour's Last of the Breed in the summer of 1986 or 87. And I just remember just loving that novel so much. And I incorporate elements of that into Savage Sun as well. So I didn't have these uh, different, I guess, filters built up over years and years and years. Because if you go back to read that, now you're reading it at a different time. And, you know, someone goes to put up, is searching for a quarter to make a call. You know, if you were to read that today, it just doesn't have the same kind of, it's just different than if you read that at 11, 12, 13 years old right. back in the 80s when you actually had to get a quarter to make a phone call. So, right. <laughs> uh, so I like that I had that foundation and I feel extremely fortunate that my parents uh, introduced me to reading and this love of reading at such an early age. Yeah, I remember reading The Most Dangerous Game in middle or high school, whenever it is that you read it, but uh, I will probably not be a novelist um, in my lifetime. It's not my calling. Um, but like you said, you knew you wanted to be a SEAL from a really young age, and then you knew you wanted to be an author from a really young age. But uh, it, I would say it's a pretty big jump, both of those things, from wanting to do them to doing them. So what really motivated you and helped you finish your first book when you started writing it? Um, and, and who are you still reading and, and listening to and being motivated by now? 
you know, I still read all those guys, but a lot of it now is not the way I used to before in that there's so many other things I need to read, like books I have to blurb or for my podcast called Danger Close. I have to like read a book because I'm going to interview someone about it, that sort of thing. A lot of the research for these novels, like this last one, Devil's Hand, was super research intensive, much more than the first three novels. Um, the first three, like I'd already been to Iraq, I'd been to Afghanistan. Uh, for the second one, I'd been to the Ukraine, I'd been to Morocco. I hadn't been to Mozambique, so I went to Mozambique. Uh, third one, I hadn't been to Kamchatka Peninsula, just south of Siberia. So I went there. Um, so I like to do that, um, that, that research. But this fourth one, COVID hit, uh, as I was finishing up my the medical research that I did for, for this, and I thought I'd jump around a little bit to some of the places I hadn't been to before, but COVID locked down, so didn't get to do that. But I still had to I didn't have any touch points with the medical side of the house and the research for this. Like the other ones, I'm talking about guns and knives and tactics and those sorts of things. Some of the intelligence side of the house where I have little touch points, I can confirm things. Like I already know them and I just go back and can confirm, learn a few more things, incorporate that. But for Devil's Hand, I knew nothing about bioweapons. Uh, I knew nothing, I mean, very basic stuff on the history of bioweapons. And none of it came from my time in the military. Most of it came from Richard Preston's The Hot Zone that I read when it came out back in the 90s. Um, so I tried to do a ton of that that kind of research. So today, rather than sitting down to, uh, to read and just kind of enjoy a book, and that's kind of what I miss most, I guess, is that I haven't done that in so long because there's always a purpose behind it these days. Like I have to interview somebody, right? I want to like not lie about saying I read their book and you know, that sort of thing. So I have to like, do it real quick, but it's, but there, there's pressure on to do it by a certain time. So it's a little different today, um, sitting down to, to read a book or over the past three years anyway, that's kind of how it's, how it's been. But at some point I hope to move into a position where I can take this breath and then start reading kind of for enjoyment again, um, because I do love, love reading. I'm a fan. First and foremost, I'm a fan of the genre. Um, and what was the first part of your question? I feel like I jumped to the end one. <laughs> um, well, my, the first part of my question was just how did you, you know, actually get the focus to sit down and finish writing the first one? I mean, I know writing a book is an incredibly tough thing to do. Um, and so where did the motivation to, you know, finish it and, and really carry out that vision of being an author? Where did that come from? Yeah, just knowing that I was just kind of the same thing for the SEAL teams. Like there are certain things that I did to prepare for that. Uh, my whole life was really spent in, in preparation for doing this, for writing. Uh, although I didn't look at it that way at the time. I looked at these things, uh, SEAL teams and writing as two separate and distinct um, chapters. But really, I now I see that uh, they, uh, they supplement one another. Um, so I didn't really, and I guess I was so young when I decided I wanted to do both. It never really entered my mind that how quote unquote hard it is. I just knew, hey, it's hard. That's why I want to do it. That was part of the allure back then when you're in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade when you're deciding that you want to like, do these things. Um, so it was never really, it wasn't something I thought too much about. I was just like, you sit down and you do it. Um, just like SEAL Team, you, you go to the buds and you don't quit. Okay. Like, like almost that simple. Um, I didn't overthink it, I guess. And people ask me a lot of, about, you know, hey, what books did you read to prepare? And really it was that whole lifetime of reading. And there are a few that are helpful though. I think like on reading by Stephen King, or sorry, on, on writing by Stephen King, obviously uh, there are these series of books by Stephen Pressfield who wrote Gates of Fire, Legend of the Bagger Vance, but he has a series of books on creativity. One's called The War of Art, uh, Turning Pro, Do the Work, Authentic Swing. Um, so there are a few out there. David Morrell's The Successful Novelist. So there's a few, and what I really enjoy are the ones that are like autobiographical, like on writing is for, for Stephen King, just like the series on creativity is for Stephen Pressfield. Like he has all these autobiographical biographical elements woven in. Uh, there's a Frederick Forsyth one that uh, that came out this past year. Jean Le Carré has the Pigeon Tunnel, which came out a couple years ago. Um, so I really enjoy those, but I think you can almost, and it's not just for writing, it's for anything in life, you can almost research too much. And because eventually you have to do it. Um, you can either use it as a crutch, whether you know it or not, um, but you can research how to do something forever. Eventually you have to do it. So uh, I think I knew that going in and knew that, okay, I'm gonna go for me, what, what's comfortable for me, okay, is reading some of the things I've already read, already explored before, uh, just touch base with some of those books again, and uh, then dive in and do it. So that's that's really as simple, it's really as simple as that. Jack, real quick on point on that, you must struggle, or at least writers must struggle with boundaries. I mean, your story can go on forever and ever and ever, it'll never end. <laughs> like boundaries as far as what? As far as uh, well, engagement? Just, just sort of like, you know, when you're writing a story, I could just see myself like you just keep writing and writing and the, the, that, that, the, the, the character does this and then makes this turn and then keeps going and then we're going to add, no, four more chapters. Like 
you have to find a way to stop, right? <laughs> yeah, so I do start with an outline. So I start with, yeah. uh, and, I, and I didn't, no one told me to do this. I didn't get this from any of the books that I read. Yeah. And I keep pointing over there because my books are all on the shelves across from me now. Um, but uh, I started with an executive summary, kind of like a, what you'd read in the book flap to get Got your it. attention. Um, so I start with an executive summary and then I turn that into an outline. And then I turn that outline into the actual narrative. So, um, but I don't get too crazy about the outline if I run into something that's going to kind of trip me up. Because I know that over the year of writing these things that I'll figure it out. Um, so on the battlefield, you're making very quick decisions. Um, you're adapting to the enemy. The enemy's always adapting to you. You're looking for gaps in the enemy's defenses. You're going to capitalize on momentum, all these things. And I do that both in the stories and then to solve problems. But I don't, I'm not under the time, that's not a time crunch. Uh, and I have a year plus to do these things. Um, and I get to get to work through them. I can sleep on them. And if I make a mistake, you know what? That's okay. The consequences aren't nearly as dire as they were in Iraq and Afghanistan. But you're right. You can go on forever. But having that outline um, and having that visual representation of kind of how long it's going to be ish, uh, I found that very, very helpful because I know where I'm going. Uh, I know how it starts. And in this case, like I'm writing book five right now. Uh, it's all outlined. I'm writing. I'm turning the outline into a narrative. And I already know book six. I know book six, how it's beginning, middle and end. So none of my bandwidth is wasted thinking about, oh, geez, uh, how am I going to end book five? Or uh, if I know the ending of book five, then starting to worry about how to start book six, like that sort of thing. Like I no bandwidth is wasted on that. It is all focused on book five to make that the best story that it can possibly be. So I find that having that outline in place, having that executive summary in place has really, up to this point anyway, uh, really kept me on track. That's great. And you, one last you've final question. About, the, oh, sorry, Kelly, go ahead. I, I had a, I had a follow-up. You've talked about in the past um, when you went to write the first novel, uh, it was during your last year in the Navy, you did that outline, like you said, but you had initially seven ideas and, and you went with one. Uh, have these, you know, outlines of you as you've continued to write, have they followed those other seven, you know, ideas that you had when you first started writing? Yep. So uh, thus far, not all of them, but so I wrote down those six, seven, eight different ideas, however many it was. And it was I wanted to write Savage Sun first. I wanted to write the third one first, that tribute to the most dangerous game, because I've been thinking about it since the sixth grade. Uh, but I knew that the characters weren't developed enough to explore those themes, that uh, that dark side of man to the dynamic of Hunter and Hunted that I really wanted to explore uh, in a modern, almost retelling of that of that story, um, at least inspired by, in a, in a very, you know, uh, intense and real way. Um, but I knew that I had to start with something that was very primal, very visceral, very hard hitting out of the gate that was most apt to get noticed by a New York publisher. Um, and that was The Terminalist. I, it was no question, like that's the one to start with. And then I got to the end of that and I realized, okay, still not ready for Savage Sun. Still, I have to take the readers on this journey of transition with my main character. I couldn't just after the traumatic events of the first one, I couldn't just like just start another one. Uh, all of a sudden he's all better with like a one sentence explanation. No, I had to take him on this journey of redemption. Uh, he had to learn to live again, find that next mission in life, find that next passion in life to continue that story. And took a little bit of a risk with that. But, but uh, my, and I thought the publisher was actually, my editor would take it out, but she hasn't taken hardly anything out of anything uh, thus far anyway. She's like her edits on content have been almost nothing. Uh, up to this point, which is kind of kind of crazy, um, but uh, so the so the, so those ideas though those first three were part of those initial five six seven eight nine different uh, ideas that I wrote down. Uh, this fourth one, Devil's Hand, I came up with that one in in the and I always knew I wanted to explore what the enemy has learned by watching us on the field of battle over the last twenty years. Like that was in that mix, but not the bioweapon part of it, and not the nine eleven tie in part of it. Um, that was all uh, from a conversation that I had with somebody in uh, 2017, actually down in Argentina, about security precautions in advance of 9-11 and how those changed afterwards. So that kind of set the ball rolling there. Um, and then the one that I'm, that I'm working on now was also one of these uh, five, six, seven, eight different ideas that I wrote down at the beginning, morphed a bit because all the stories have now mor morphed with all the thought that I put into them. Um, but it was still uh, on the table back then. Right. All right, Jack, we're going to switch, a little, go back a little bit, talk a little bit about your career as a SEAL. Uh, Dylan, take us away. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I don't really think the average person understands, you know, what goes into not, not only BUDS, but, you know, the workup before deployment when you're in the teams. Uh, you know, would you be able to, to give a little bit of insight on kind of what goes into that? You know, because I feel like everybody just kind of sees 
pictures of a bunch of guys on the beach with boats and people jumping on them and laying down in the sand with their head in the water. Like, can you give a little bit more on that and, uh, you know, what the work, you know, once you're in, what the workup is like? Yeah, so it is uh, it is a lot of that in Buds. The pictures do tell that tale fairly well. Um, although when you're looking at those pictures, you're usually warm at home, uh, comfortable. Uh, and obviously on the beach, you are not uh, in the middle of all week. Uh, the boat over your head or on the verge of hypothermia, you know, with your, on uh, Thursday night, you haven't slept for days and all that sort of thing. So they just try to make it as uncomfortable as possible. That first phase of SEAL training is really to see, hey, are you tough enough? Do you have that? Uh, that uh, that grit that we're looking for. Uh, and then you move on, if you pass that, and that's typically where most of the 80% attrition comes from is in those first, uh, that first phase, those first few weeks of SEAL training where you where you have hell week and you get that attrition. Um, and then a second one is dive phase. You move in dive phase, now they're looking to see, okay, we got you, you're pretty tough, but uh, who's comfortable in the water now at this point? And so they put you through this diving, protocol that uh, really weeds out to, you learn how to dive, of course, both open circuit and closed circuit, closed circuit, someone with no bubbles. But uh, so you do get that very basic, obviously. But uh, what you're really finding out is who's comfortable at water, who's going to be comfortable under a ship in the middle of the night, in the dark, uh, when something bumps you, uh, or you run out of air under that ship, something goes wrong with your rig and you have your dive buddy right there. Like who's gonna be able to not freak out in those situations? And then third phase is the land warfare phase. And that's really, once again, all basic, uh, really just making sure that people are safe with weapons and safe with demolition. Um, and then from there, you go under another six months of training called SEAL qualification training. And at this point, now they're actually trying to teach you something. Now they're teaching you these basics, tactics, techniques, and procedures as it pertains to jumping out of planes and diving and uh, close quarter battle and land warfare and all these other things you need to do in special operations. Um, and then you get to your team. And now you move on to that next level. Now you're working with the guys that you're going to go downrange with. And you're going to do mountain warfare training, desert warfare training, urban warfare training. You're still jumping out of the planes. You're still diving. You're doing all these things, but you're doing it with the guys now that you're going to deploy with. So that's about an 18 month cycle. And then you deploy for six to seven months and you come back and you do it all again. So during that 18 months that you're working up, you're also away from home a ton. So people know that you're downrange, okay, you're downrange for the six months or eight months or whatever it might be. Uh, but they don't really realize when you're home, you're gone most of the time to go to these training venues because they're not in your backyard. You're traveling around the country to go to these different venues for two weeks here, a week here, a month here, and you're just constantly in this cycle, improving your skills, building upon uh, what you learned downrange if you've already deployed and moving forward. So that uh, that pendulum, when we talk about like that, that work family balance that people talk about, there's no work family balance. That pendulum is all on the side of the team and it has to be because that's what you owe the guys to your right and left, that's what you owe their families, that's what you owe the country, that's what you owe the mission. So, uh, so it's tough, it's tough on the families for sure because you're gone so much and the sole focus has to be the team. That's just how it has to be. Uh, so now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get that pendulum swing back uh, the other way towards the towards the family. So that's uh, that, that's part of this next chapter in life. Yeah. Jack, yeah one, well, one quick follow up to that, um, and if you can talk about it, great. And just at a high level, when you uh, when you're when you're deployed to go on a mission, are you given? Is it like you're you're having dinner with your family and the, the red phone rings and 12 hours later you're in the Indian Ocean or wherever wherever it is or is it is it you, you get some time to plan and you know it's coming yeah that can happen um yeah. that, that happened to me only once maybe twice twice yeah but uh but usually you're doing that workup and then you deploy to an area of operations. So you can go, uh, you could be going to sit in Guam maybe, or you could be going down to, to Colombia, or you could be going to uh, Africa. You could be going to sit in Germany, waiting on a contingency somewhere. Uh, you could be going to sit on a ship somewhere, or you could be going to Iraq and Afghanistan, in which case you know uh, what you're gonna be doing. So you're doing this workup kind of tailored towards Iraq, Afghanistan, if you know you're going there. So it's not a surprise. You kind of know the date you're going, you're getting over there, you do a turnover with the platoon or the troop that's over there uh, about a week or so, two weeks sometimes, and then they go back home and then you take over. And then six months later, another one comes in, you do that turnover with them, you go home and they continue on. And they build on the lessons that you've learned and then they do, they do the same uh, when they turn over with the next group. So uh, for the most part, you know where you're going, although it does uh, happen, uh, particularly at some of the more specialized commands in the Navy and the Army, that they get that page uh, because something happens. 
that doesn't fit into that normal. You have these commitments already to Iraq, Afghanistan, Colombia, uh, Pacific, wherever you're going, and you just can't grab the guys there, pick them up and throw them on an outlier, if that makes sense. So oftentimes that outlier is for the guys that are home in the states that are just waiting for something like that to happen. So Got that's, uh, that's kind of how that works. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. So you touched earlier on that never quit mentality. Um, I've heard you talk about it in terms of buds and things like that when it comes to SEAL training. Do you think there's anything else um, being a Navy SEAL has provided that's helped you, you know, now that you're not in the Navy anymore? Or, or is that really the biggest lesson that helps you with success out of the Navy? I think I kind of had it a little bit before the military and the same things that helped me get through buds or to, you know, to lead uh, guys downrange in combat are some of the th same things that I think about today if something's difficult. And uh, like in the middle of hell week, I would think, OK, yeah, this is hard, but you know what it's not? It's not me as like an 18, 19, 20 year old kid waiting for the door to come crashing down on a beach in Normandy and then running across the beach with no cover, no concealment uh, and run into a hail of machine gun bullets from somebody whose nose I'm coming, watching me come in just to get in range and is in an elevated position. Uh, like I'm not doing that. Um, I'm not uh, doing what a lot of these guys in Vietnam had to do when they went into Laos and Cambodia and you know two man teams or maybe with some other indigenous forces to to plant what was essentially a uh, a, a tape recorder a plus record and leave it on the side of a trail to listen to uh, the enemy as they walked down the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, and record some of that uh, that Vietnamese and then physically get that what would be like a cassette recorder for us in the 80s but say essentially very similar thing take it back to base and exploit that intelligence. Um, you know, I'm not running over the beach at Iwo Jima, like that sort of thing. So I thought, you know what, I, I'm on the verge of hypothermia here, uh, but I can do a few more push-ups. I can hold this boat over my head for a little while longer. Uh, you know, this isn't, so I, I thought about things in relative terms and that really, I think helped. And I continue to think about that today. I think, you know, hey, you know, I'm not doing those things. I'm not waiting for that uh, that door to come crashing down and run into the, to the surf zone or run into uh, up onto this beach. I can take a breath and you know those and also it helps uh with a few other things as well in just being uh, uh respectful and thankful each and every day for the people that did do that so that i can be here today writing or if i go back 20 some years uh i can be on that beach following my dream doing these push-ups uh in my quest to to serve my country as a seal and so i think of what people sacrificed from the inception of this country up through today to give us these options, to give us these opportunities, to give us these freedoms uh, that we've been entrusted with, that they sacrificed everything for, that we now owe it to this next generation to pass along. So I often think today that most, not most, but a lot of the most, the, the loudest people out there, especially in, on social media side of the house, haven't really spent that time, energy, and effort, haven't put that requisite thought into some of the things that for the most part, they're retweeting from people who also did not do that study, didn't open these books, didn't go into history to find out, hey, why do we have these freedoms? Why do we have these opportunities? Why do we have these options today? And then make decisions based off of that. Um, so that's why I try to encourage everybody as much as I possibly can to get in the pages of those books. There's nothing more valuable. So you were in the Navy for 20 years. You you knew when that 20 years came that your time in the Navy was, was going to be over and that you had a new mission at home with your family. So you've been a SEAL, a New York Times bestselling author. You're at, you're at home now with your family. Uh, is that the mission or is there something next for Jack Carr? Yeah, the mission is taking care of my family and the passion is writing. So I combine those two uh, moving forward. But uh, but yeah, no, that's that's it. That's it. It's uh, focusing on the family and then continuing, hopefully, to get better at my craft on the on the writing side of the house as I continue to build out the readership. But uh, really, that's what it's. Uh, but that's that's what it's. I don't have any uh, political ambitions or anything like that. There's no other another next step or anything like that. It's uh, it's taking care of, of my family the best I can, being a good example for them and and continuing to because. When I look at like a, a readership, or right, I think about that person who's making a decision about how to spend their time, uh, they're trusting me with that time, whether they're listening to it on audio, or they're going to flip the page of that novel, or they're going to follow me on social media. Uh, they're still trusting me with that most valuable asset, their time. And so uh, I take that very seriously. And what I owe them then is my best effort. And I owe them uh, something that is thoughtful. 
Uh, so for the most part, I really try to be thoughtful in my engagement, whether it's uh, on, on the marketing and social media engagement side, or it's in the, the novels. So uh, that's that's the uh, that's the path forward is to get better at uh, at all of that. Cool. All right, Jack. Uh, time is almost up, but we wanted to close with one final question. Um, what's the best professional advice you ever received in your career? I don't know if I received so. I mean, my, my mantra and what I try to pass on to the kids is to never pay attention to the odds because there will be so many people out there that uh, will tell you, even if it's just with a look, uh, they don't have to say anything a lot of the times um, to discourage you, whether they mean to or not. Uh, when you tell someone you want to be a SEAL, they all think that either you're going to fail or if you're very young, that you're going to grow out of it. Like, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up type thing. They're like, well, that's nice. You know, uh, little Johnny's going to grow out of that. He's not, there's no way he's going to be an astronaut. But some kids cling on to that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's never paying attention to those odds because you're wasting bandwidth worried about them. Uh, bandwidth that needs to be focused on getting you where you need to go. So I can either worry about how hard it was to, to be a SEAL and make it through, through buds, uh, or I could be like, okay, it's very difficult. And then all my energy and effort is on getting there. How do I be, how do, uh, to get in shape, train myself mentally, physically, get ready for that, for that training. So same thing with writing. Everyone's going to tell you that how impossible it is to be a number one New York Times bestselling author. Um, I just never paid attention to that. I just knew that that was going to happen. That was my, that was my path. So I wasn't worried about it over here. It was all focused on making the novels the best that they could possibly be. So, um, so there's that one. And then Brad Thor passed along a little advice to me when I started out on this, on this journey. And I was about four months into to writing actually. And uh, he said, the only difference between a published author and an unpublished author is that the published author never quit. And uh, I think someone passed that to him. And that really resonated with me because same thing with buds. You know, what, are, what do all the SEALs have in common? Well, they didn't ring that bell three times during buds. Uh, so that one really resonated with me. And then uh, something I try to pass on to the kids as well is to never miss an opportunity to make somebody's day. So yeah. I try to, try to do that as well. Cool. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Jack, thank you for uh, for joining us today, and you know we we really appreciate your time. And uh, I know everyone's looking forward to uh, book number five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on and so on. So uh, you know we'll, we'll continue to keep an eye out. And uh, you know I know you mentioned your social media, and man, you got some great content on there. So anyone listening, I highly suggest you go follow this man: Instagram, Twitter, the whole nine. Jack Carr USA is his handle. Um, so Jack, again, thank you for your time, and uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me on. I love, as you can probably tell, I love talking books and reading. It's, uh, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So uh, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Today's episode is brought to you by Silencer Shop, the largest distributor of firearm suppressors in the country. A single incident of loud noise can cause permanent hearing damage. With almost all firearms creating noise over 140 decibels, a silencer can protect you and the people around you from hearing loss. Silencer Shop's team of sales and compliance experts make acquiring a silencer simple. With their easy step-by-step -step process of purchasing a silencer, you can enjoy safer, quieter hunts and days at the range. There are more than 1,000 Silencer Shop powered kiosks at partner dealerships in 42 states, so getting your documentation in order has never been easier. Visit silencershop.com to learn more today. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.